Hey everyone, my name is Nikki Young and this is Serial Napper, an international true crime podcast. I'm back with another true crime story to lull you to sleep or perhaps to give you nightmares. I'm opening this episode up with a question. Do you let your children go to sleepovers at their friend's house? If you don't, why not? If yes, do you trust that your child will be safe there? Do you really know the adults and any other people that live in that home? You may rethink that sleepover after listening to tonight's case. Teenage girls, 14-year-old Ivy Webster and 16-year-old Brittany Brewer had plans to go to a sleepover at the home of their best friend, 13-year-old Tiffany Guess. The two girls had gone to her home many times in the past and nothing seemed out of the ordinary on this occasion. However, when the girls did not return home the following morning and were unreachable by cell phone, a police search of the home that they were staying at would reveal one of the most horrific crime scenes local officers had ever witnessed. Unbeknownst to just about everyone, there was a sexual predator by the name of Jesse McFadden who lived in the home, and when he became pressured by the possibility of going back to jail, he snapped, killing everyone who was in the house. This mass murder, now known as the Henrietta Killings, will make you rethink just how well you know the people in your life and how much you really trust them with your children. So let's jump right in. We're going to start right at the sleepover, which happened just this past April, May, 2023. 14-year-old Ivy Webster, 16-year-old Brittany Brewer, and 13-year-old Tiffany Guess made plans to have a sleepover at Tiffany's home. The three girls had been best friends for the last couple of years, so they had a ton of sleepovers in the past, and they had all been at each other's homes and met each other's parents. The girls got along great, and all of the parents, they were acquainted with one another. They weren't necessarily friends, but they had all met. None of them could have predicted that anything like this would happen. The girls lived in Henrietta, Oklahoma, which is a very small town with a population of only around 6,000 people. This tight-knit community really felt safe, which made these events all that much more shocking. Tiffany lived with her mother, Holly Guess, her stepfather, Jesse McFadden, and her two older siblings, Michael and Riley. It was a little-known secret within the family that Jesse McFadden had a tendency to be in control, and he always knew where his wife, Holly, or his stepchildren were at all times. Still, no one really knew the extent of it. Holly's sister, Heather, would later say that she had only met Jesse a few times, and whenever she stopped by the house, he would basically stay in the computer room and not really engage with her at all. He was described as very quiet and standoffish. Holly's family didn't really like him, but she was an adult who could make her own decisions, and now he was moving in with her and her three kids. Sadly, now they wish they would have done more to get her away from him, but of course hindsight is 2020. Before all of this happened, Holly had been controlled and manipulated by Jesse, and while he did have a pretty horrible criminal past, he lied to Holly to hide the severity of what he had done. Prior to Holly and Jesse's marriage, he had served 17 years in prison for rape. Holly was aware of the charges when she met him, but Jesse had completely spun the story to downplay what he had done. If she had any idea of the true nature of Jesse's crimes, her friends and family say that she would have never married him or lived with him, putting her children in danger. Holly was a devoted mother who was sadly controlled by Jesse McFadden's lies. So let's pause here to talk about Jesse's past and all of the lengths that he went to in order to conceal the truth from his wife, Holly. Jesse's first victim that we know of was a 16-year-old girl named Crystal Strong. When Jesse was 19 years old, he broke into Crystal's home and he had every intention of hurting her. He tied her up with a belt and he raped her at knife point. 
Um, so I grew up, uh, my dad lived around there, um, around Canadian shores. And um, I was, I grew up with um, his girlfriend and her sister. Um, and he had showed up. I had been at a party that night um, in McAllister and I had left my truck in McAllister and got um, drove home by someone else, some friends. Um, and three friends actually, and my stepmom had drove by that night in the middle of my rape, but they kept going because my truck wasn't there. But Jesse had showed up. Um, and kept telling me that Holly kicked him out. He needed somewhere to go, um, things like that. And I was like, look, you really just need to call Holly. Like, you don't need to be here. And then I remember just being shoved through my door, um, a sock in my mouth and being tied up to my own bed um, and just horrible things happening. I remember the DA telling me that I would never have children. In a media interview, Crystal would describe the traumatic attack. She said, quote, he was shoving a sock in my mouth, and next thing, I was being dragged through the living room, tied to my futon with one of my dad's bungee cords. It was very traumatic. When he was on top of me, he pulled out a knife. He stuck it to my throat and kept pushing harder and harder, saying, if you don't shut up, I swear to God, I'll kill you right here. Luckily, Crystal was able to escape with her life, and she ran to a neighbor's home for help, where they called the police. Jesse would be found just a few hours later by authorities near a river with both of his wrists slit. Apparently, after the assault, he had planned to take his own life, but now he was off to prison instead. Jesse would be sentenced to serve 20 years behind bars for his crime. While there, he made one of his cellmates, in particular, very uncomfortable. According to James Fleming, an inmate who was serving time for burglary, during the 16-ish months or so that they shared a cell, Jesse would display signs that he was not a changed man or remorseful in any way for his crimes. He was very aggressive, manipulative, and he stalked one female prison guard in particular. Um, uh, so when I first met Jesse, he just seemed like a normal, clean cut, you know, another inmate, another convict. But, uh, you know, as we moved in together and we shared a cell, you know, it's about, uh, I would say about six months into it, I just realized how weird he was. Um, his conversations would always turn into sexual conversations. Uh, he was, he, he was just, uh, a very awkward guy. Um, I caught him, you know, stalking nurses down at the medical facilities. Uh, you know, he, he was just your very, very awkward, weird person. Fleming would say that he could never let his guard down because, quote, had I been weaker, both physically and mentally, and had I not let him know my boundaries, I think he would have tried to take advantage of me sexually, whether he did it by manipulation or by force. Anytime that Jesse would be up for parole, his victim, Crystal, would fight with everything that she had to ensure that he stayed where he belonged, in prison. Which should have been a no-brainer, because during his 20-year sentence in 2017, Jesse would be caught and charged with using a contraband cell phone to communicate with a 16-year-old girl. Yeah, that's right. While serving his sentence for raping a teenage girl, now as an adult, he would be caught using a cell phone to talk to another teenage girl. And yet, just three years later, while that charge was still pending, Jesse McFadden was released. I know people get all pissy when I criticize the systems that we have in place that are supposed to keep people safe, but you have to admit that it makes zero sense to release a convicted rapist from prison early while he is still facing more charges in connection to communicating with a teenage girl from behind bars, and they weren't talking about the weather. The young lady that he had been chatting with, her name is Caitlin Babb, and the story of how she came into contact with Jesse McFadden is very surprising. 16-year-old Caitlin had recently moved states with her grandparents. As part of this move, she switched her cell phone number to a local one. One day, she gets a message from this unknown number. It's someone who's trying to reach the old owner of Caitlin's new cell phone number. 
it's Jesse McFadden, who was contacting the cell phone number from behind bars using a contraband cell phone. At that time, Caitlin was having a difficult go. It was rough. She was a teenage girl, she's moved to a new town, and she didn't have any friends yet. It was sadly really easy for Jesse McFadden to take advantage of that situation and to convince Caitlin to stay in contact with him moving forward. As they messaged back and forth, it wasn't long before the tone of the conversation became sexual. Jesse began to ask Caitlin for inappropriate photos, and Caitlin would send them, believing that the pair were in a relationship together. Jesse would make her believe that he loved her and that once he got out of jail, they would finally be together. He would even send her letters through the mail, including one that was signed from husband, which her grandparents found and reported to the Oklahoma Department of Corrections. And that's how he got caught. Now he was facing new charges in connection to this communication with a minor. But it didn't seem to matter because in 2020, Jesse was released from prison early. And this is when he would meet Holly and begin this whirlwind romantic relationship. Holly had two young daughters at home. And I can't help but wonder if maybe that was part of the motivation for Jesse even pursuing this relationship with her. As I mentioned, it was a bit of a whirlwind romance, with Jesse and Holly marrying just a year after he was released from prison. Holly was aware of Jesse's rape charges, but he would always downplay the severity of the incident and somehow make himself look like the victim. He went as far as to pay someone who looked like his rape victim, Crystal, to play an act and speak to Holly and say things like she was actually 19 years old when the rape happened, not 16, and that of course it wasn't really rape, it was more of a misunderstanding. It's crazy to think that someone would go this far to conceal what they did, but whatever story he was spinning to Holly, it seemed to be working. Now with Holly and his stepkids under his control, None of their acquaintances were aware of Jesse's past either, which is why Ivy and Brittany's parents had no issue with their girls going to the McFadden home for a sleepover on Saturday night with the youngest stepchild, Tiffany. Both girls would be home Sunday morning and they would stay in contact with their parents throughout the evening on Saturday night via text and instant messenger and social media. However, the following morning was Sunday, and while Ivy and Brittany had planned to return home that day at around 5 p.m., Ivy would text her mother that she would be home a bit later because she was heading to a nearby ranch with the girls. It's now believed that someone else had actually sent the messages because Ivy had already been taken from this world at this point. Later, after speaking with the owners, it would be learned that they never made it to the ranch at all. No one had shown up at the ranch, not Jesse, not the girls, none of them. So it's assumed that they were all deceased as of Saturday night. On Sunday, just after 5 p.m., Ivy's mother would receive a phone call from Jesse McFadden. He said that he was at the ranch with the girls, but they had poor cell phone reception, so they were having difficulty making and receiving phone calls. This would give Jesse a bit more time before Ivy and Brittany's parents became suspicious about why they were not home yet. However, as the hours passed and it was late Sunday evening, they were not reachable and the girls did not return home. It became clear to their parents that something wasn't right. When they still had not returned home late into the evening, Ivy and Brittany's parents called the police to report them missing. By the following day, which was a Monday morning, the police paid the McFadden residents a visit. They knocked on the door, but there was no answer. They couldn't really do anything further at that point because they didn't have a warrant. But one officer noticed a pile of freshly dug dirt, which they thought was suspicious, and it was enough to go back and get a warrant. That dirt pile would turn out to be completely irrelevant to the situation, but it did get the ball rolling. While that was happening, an Amber Alert was put out, and that's when it was revealed what an absolute monster Jesse McFadden was. 
The alert that went out to everyone's phones, including the phones of Ivy's parents and Brittany's parents, stated that the two missing girls were believed to be with a convicted rapist who was now facing a new sex crimes trial. This was the very first time that these parents were learning that they had allowed their daughters to stay at the house of a convicted rapist who had possibly recently reoffended. Ivy's mother, Ashley, would say, quote, We had no idea. We didn't find out until we saw the Amber Alert with his mugshot. Then, our phones started blowing up from Facebook and people just sending us everything they knew about it. It was also learned that Jesse McFadden had missed his court hearing that was scheduled for that Monday morning. He was supposed to be facing those charges from when he had that cell phone in jail and was communicating with a child. If he was convicted, this would have landed him back in prison for the rest of his life. Police were able to successfully get the warrant for the McFadden property, which is a hundred acres, so it's a massive area that they had to search. This is why they returned with a drone, and when they used it to scan the areas surrounding the home, they made a shocking discovery. It was the bodies of the two missing teenage girls, Ivy and Brittany, along with the bodies of Jesse's wife, Holly, and his three stepchildren, Michael, Riley, and Tiffany, which would be found in two different locations on the property. Ivy, Brittany, and Riley were found about a quarter of a mile away from the house, while the other bodies would be discovered in a wooded area near the property. All of the victims had been shot in the head with a 9mm handgun. Ivy and Brittany had also been sexually assaulted. After he had done this and killed his entire family, as well as the two girls who were visiting for the sleepover, Jesse McFadden turned the gun on himself. After discovering the bodies outside, investigators moved inside the house to begin processing the scene and collecting evidence. They found it to be more similar to a house of horrors than that of a family home. There were drugs lying everywhere, a bunch of sex toys, restraints, including Velcro handcuffs, numerous cell phones, including the victims, and something else very interesting. It was a ledger, which included a list of names and dates. Several of the victims' names were listed in this ledger, but there were several other names not familiar to the investigators. So was this a list of people who he had raped, murdered? Were the other names on this list other victims of Jesse McFadden? The property was thoroughly searched by the police, including digging up the terrain with an excavator and combing through wooded areas surrounding the house, but unfortunately nothing else was found. This mass murder-suicide rocked this little community. The killing of a mother and her three children, along with two innocent teenage girls, People were particularly shocked and outraged that Jesse McFadden had been allowed out of prison early, despite the fact that he had been caught communicating with a minor. And even more information was beginning to leak. A few nights before it's alleged that Jesse McFadden murdered six people, he told his mother that he was going to kill his family and then himself. His mother didn't think he was serious, so she never reported it. Presumably after Jesse committed the murders, he decided to send one last message to that teenage girl that he had been talking to while in prison. Jesse would send Caitlin Babb, who was now 23 years old, a Facebook message from his wife Holly's account. It said, quote, I did exactly what I promised I would do when I got out. I got a marketing job making great money and was being advanced. Been there two years now and made a great life like I promised I would do with you. Now it's all gone. I told you I wouldn't go back. This is all on you for continuing this. Jesse was referring to the court date that was scheduled for the following day where Caitlin would be testifying against him in the child sex abuse trial. He was really trying to blame her for him killing six people because he knew that he was going back to jail for what he did to her when she was just 16 years old. 
I can't imagine the kind of guilt and sadness one would feel receiving a message like that, even though it is in no way her fault. Caitlin was another one of Jesse McFadden's victims. He had her completely manipulated to the point where when she was younger, she drove two hours from her grandparents' home to the court where she pleaded with them to drop the charges. She really struggled with understanding that Jesse didn't really love her. He was just using her. However, eventually she did stop having any contact with him and that's when she agreed to testify against him. What should have happened from there was a trial within a reasonable amount of time where Jesse would have had to face those charges while still in prison. Unfortunately, he was released and due to years of delay, he wouldn't be tried for these new charges until just this past May, 2023. At that point, he had far too much to lose to go back to prison without incident. We moved here two years ago and Tiffany, Guess, and our daughter were best friends. And we, the, the, I, I guess if Holly had to say something knowing that he was, then she should have said something. But we didn't really know anything about this guy. We had a read on him that he was a little weird, but we felt comfortable, especially knowing that several of our daughter's friends would go over there all the time and hang out. They would go over there on the weekends. Tiffany would come over here at our house and stay here on the weekends. And it was just back and forth and we never suspected any kind of maliciousness. Ivy and Brittany's family are now lobbying for stricter laws when it comes to convicted child sex offenders including the addition of what they're calling the Knight's Law, which would see a convicted child predator serve a life sentence in prison without any possibility of parole, in addition to several other protection measures. If you live in Oklahoma and would like to view and sign the petition, I'll make sure I have that link in my show notes. That's it for me tonight. If you want to reach out, you can find me on Facebook at Serial Napper. You can also search for me on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. Check me out on Twitter at Serial underscore Napper if it doesn't completely implode by the end of the day, or I post things on TikTok, Serial Napper Nick, and that's all one word. If you're watching on YouTube, I'd love if you can give me a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you're not watching on YouTube, I also post all of my podcast episodes in video format over there. So go check it out. Until next time, sweet dreams, stay kind, especially in the comments. Bye.